The Chargers preseason game against the Cowboys was brutal to watch at times, but there were some silver linings, especially across the offensive line, and maybe even some separation at right tackle. You are Locked On Chargers, your daily podcast on the Los Angeles Chargers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What is up and welcome into the Lockdown Chargers podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Wade, joined as always by my co-host, David Drogemeyer. And we've been covering the Chargers now for over six seasons together. But we're headed into our fifth season as the host of the Lockdown Chargers podcast, bringing you your team every day. Thank you guys so much for making us your first listen on this Monday. And to make sure you never miss the show, go subscribe to the Lockdown Chargers YouTube channel. And also follow the show for free on all platforms, wherever you get your podcast from. But... David, we did get to go back and watch the offensive line. I think we had some really good takeaways, including, I think, Trey Pipkins being the better of the two right tackles in this game and really some excellent play from the interior of the offensive line from two rookies, Zion Johnson and Jamari Sawyer. But we all know how that preseason game went. It wasn't all great, and we got to hear that from Brandon Staley, who not only called out the running backs and said that none of them are good in that game, also had a special message for some of the young players, basically – you either get it right or you get out and we'll find somebody else to go do it. So that was surprising. Another small surprise, I guess, was Tom Telesco already coming out and saying the Chargers will be keeping three quarterbacks basically on the broadcast of the game and also talking about a couple of defenders who stood out and maybe talking about one guy in JT Woods who's still having a rough time adjusting to the physicality at the NFL level and the tackling isn't quite there yet. But today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online. BetOnline.net has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. BetOnline, where the game starts. So, David, we talked about some things on Saturday, right? After the game, we talked about Joe Reed. Or Joe Reed. Joe Reed didn't have a great performance. We did talk about Josh Palmer's great performance, Michael Bandy, in the disaster on special teams. So today we're going to be focusing on a couple of different things, including the right tackle position, the off-talked-about right tackle position. And I think in this game, more than in the first preseason game, we at least saw a little bit of separation maybe between the two. Yeah, that's exactly right. I went back and watched both Storm Norton and Trip Trey Pipkins probably two or three times at least just while I was watching other guys as well. But, you know, for both of these guys, for, you know, starting off with, with Storm, who, who got the, the first opportunity out there at right tackle, uh, I, I thought he started out OK. Um, but unfortunately for him, I felt like his play slipped uh, as the night went on and he got worse and worse. And towards the end, there was a couple of, of bad plays back to back where it's like, OK, I don't know if that's what I want to see out there at right tackle. And then you go out there and you watch. Trey Pipkins and I feel like Trey was solid all night long I felt like he had some good run blocks I felt like he was very very solid in pass protection he looked good moving in space you know on that uh, wide receiver screen to Josh Palmer he was out there uh, as one of the lead blockers so I do feel like just after this second preseason game that there is some tangible separation between Storm Norton and Trey Pipkins and I have Trey Pipkins in that number one spot right now. Yeah, I, I do too. I would, especially just considering how everything's been. If it really was even going into it, it's hard to think that that wouldn't move the needle a little bit. As far as how the game actually went statistically for them, Storm Norton had 13 pass blocking attempts or, you know, chances where he gave up one pressure and then with Trey Pipkins, zero pressures allowed in 12 pass blocking snaps. So that's as good as you can get. But I think those stats can lie a little bit. Like with Storm Norton, there was a couple of plays that ended up being a penalty, one offensive and one defense, where he got beat pretty badly. And it won't go down as a pressure in the books because of the penalties. But I just thought, I mean, Trey Pipkins looked smoother. Trey Pipkins in the little, I mean, the first game looked a little bit panicked to me, right? He seemed a little bit kind of all over the place. In this game, it seemed like he was much more locked in. It seemed like he knew exactly where he was supposed to be. A couple nice seal box did move some people in the running game as well. And it's not over yet either, David. That's the important thing, too. But at least as of right now, we'll see how much we see of them in the third preseason game. I'm not saying it's fixed at right tackle, but Trey Pipkins looks like the one that's maybe going to start the season there. Yeah, and hey, I mean, this is kind of who we thought uh, was going to go ahead and take that job all along. The guy yeah. that we, we felt like, 
you know, he put the work in this off season uh, out there at O line masterminds with Duke Mannyweather. You know, really just trying to take his craft extremely seriously. And you know, we've had other guys go out there like Odea Bushi, who played very well for the Chargers. Rashawn in Slater, action. Yeah. Rashawn Slater, obviously the All Pro left tackle, was there as well. So I mean, hey, you you see guys go there and have success after they go train there. And so it seems like it make, made pretty good sense to Trey Pipkins and that work, you know, that we saw kind of start last year where we saw some significant development from him. seems like he is continuing that work and he's taking this very seriously, taking this very rare opportunity to be a starting right tackle in this league in a contract year very seriously. And hopefully he's the guy to man that job for the entire season. Well, and it was big for both those guys. I mean, because Storm Norton played okay. It wasn't like he was out there being terrible, but it just seemed like Trey Pickens was the better of the two. I mean, it thought he more cleanly won more reps and didn't really lose any. Didn't have any quick losses, that's for sure. But we also saw them get smoked, you know, earlier this week by Demarcus Lawrence and also by Micah Parsons, a couple of freaks from the Cowboys. And they do go up against quality guys, you know, with Joey Bosa and Cleo Mack, obviously. But it doesn't mean it's fixed. I think you're just – it's better to see – okay, we are seeing some progression here. He's definitely yes. improved from last season. And maybe, you know, he is going places and he can get better out of that position. I don't think it's fixed yet at right tackle by any means. Should it be better? I think it's definitely trending that way, at least, you know, better than last season was for sure. But yeah. I want to talk about the interior guys as well, David. I thought it was another strong showing by Zion Johnson. I mean, he was – opening lanes the the biggest run of the night i think it was josh kelly eight, nine eight or nine yards yep he opened up that hole and i thought he was super physical and i thought he was super clean in pass protection as well yeah for, for zion it's just fun to watch him man because he has like true legit power like he yeah. has tree trunks for legs and we when he anchors and he he gets both hands on you and he like forks lift forklifts you you're not going anywhere and he's got control of you and he's going to move you out of the way we saw that several times and finishing in, the block too game. right yeah. not just the pop it's the he was playing through the whistle which you love yeah. to see and you, you know just the strength so important because yeah you know, you know you can move people out of the way but you can also recover as well and you can just sit down and we saw that a couple of times as well i mean he, he just you know that that ability that that just raw power coupled with that technical ability is the reason why Zion Johnson through two preseason games surely looks to part and looks like he's going to be a great asset to this Chargers starting offensive line. Yeah. And I mean, that's not to take anything away from Jamari Sawyer, who I thought was just as good in this game and actually played (laughs) longer. Yeah. It's crazy to think, right? Because, you know, the Chargers had, you know, Dan Feeney in the third round, Forrest Lamp in the second round, they had spent some picks, you know, Chris Watt in the third round, once upon a time trying to get this right. And I mean, Jamari Sawyer looks like a steal. Zion Johnson looks like the truth. I mean, I think he's the more technically proficient of the two of them. Did have a false start in this game, obviously, and that has to get cleaned up. Saw that in practice from him as well. Yeah. But he's still getting used to it. That's, I mean, a, and he's something that happens, of course, with rookies. Jamari Sawyer, though, David, I mean, in pass protection, he was super clean. Neither one of those two dudes gave up a pressure. But with Jamari Sawyer, according to PFF, it was 35 pass blocking snaps in which he did not give up a pressure a single time. That's huge, especially combined with I think he is the more physical of the two in run blocking because I think he is the more physically like kind of dominant player. He's the bigger, thicker dude, and both of them are big and thick. But like Jamari Sawyer, I mean, how can you not be impressed with this dude? Because, I mean, he's already guard number three. I think he's blown Brendan Hymas out of the water so far during this. Yeah, it definitely makes that Brendan Hymas pick look a, a little bit bad. I mean, when he goes out there and just absolutely mauls dudes, you know, rep after and rep. And that's after what we've rep. seen fifth round picks look like, right? Fifth round yeah. picks usually look like Brendan Hymas. They don't, sixth round picks almost never looked like Jamari Sawyer early on. Which is why I still don't understand and I will not understand why or how so many teams. he got to the sixth round. I mean, I, I told you Crazy. this repeatedly. This is a third, fourth round guy, and he is proving that. Every single time he goes on the field, this guy, like I've said before, just has a presence. He has real legit size that is a problem for interior defensive linemen to get around or get through. He's so, you know, he's so smooth as a pass protector. You know, you see those those roots of him playing tackle in college. You see that kind of come to fruition playing guard at the NFL level. And then you just see the the brute force and physicality in his game, which is why I feel like it's not going to take very much time for him to really be a valuable member to this offensive line group. The depth is already immediately better because he's a member of this group. 
Yeah, I mean, like we've said before, hey, you're trying to eliminate the Senio Calamante game, right? You're trying to eliminate, you know, Ode Abushi coming down. Now you have to, you might have to get 10 games out of a, your new guard, right? Like, yeah, that is a position that seems hugely upgraded from last season. The depth in the interior looks much, much better than we've seen since when. I mean, if both these dudes can continue playing like this, it's going to be the best interior of Chargers offensive line that we've seen in our coverage of the Chargers probably since the year 2000, right? Or at least the, you know, mid 2000s, or f- maybe 04, 05, 05 yeah. maybe 06. Like it would be close, but like if, as far as depth goes, that's three guys. You, I mean, two guys you feel really good about. And one of them is not even starting right now. And it looks like he's going to have a very bright future, but those were the bright spots. There were some very dark spots to this game as well, including the running back position and some young players on special teams, two special teams, touchdowns allowed, a lot of guys' careers are going to be made on what they do in special teams, and Brandon Staley wanted them to know that. So we're going to get into what his message were was for some of those guys, and it was a stiff message, I think, and something they should be taking very seriously coming up after this. But I do need to tell you guys, if you're into placing bets, there's one place to do, and that's betonline.net. And I have the better news for you guys. Football season is back. Even if you want to bet on the preseason, get after it. It's still better than betting on most sports. And now that football is back, You need to get on betonline.net because there's so many great things to bet on over there, including a ton of Chargers-related stuff. Do you think Keenan Allen is going to have over 95 and a half receptions? He's done it the last five years in a row. That's a bet right now over under player futures on betonline.net. If they'll go over 1,000 yards receiving, that's on betonline.net. There's a ton of player futures that you guys can go get involved with and a bunch of defensive and offensive awards that you could be putting Joey Bosa or Justin Herbert's name down for betonline.net is the number one place to bet and I can't wait for my Sunday sitting around watching football all day with betonline.net going on at the same time so make sure you guys head to betonline today or use your mobile device to learn more about the action happening today at betonline where the game starts all right David we talked about the good (laughs) now it's time to talk about the bad because obviously do we have to yeah right (laughs) I mean, we did talk about some of the special team stuff, but we didn't have Brandon Staley's quotes the last time when we did our post-game show immediately after. Yeah. And I don't even know if this is just about special teams, but this was the message that he had, David. And it basically is, is don't take these games for granted. He was asked about, you know, the special teams and how bad it was and how much, you know, that could hurt some of the players trying to fight for a roster spot. And he said, I was disappointed because that's not the way we practice this week. That's not the way the guys performed in practice. And to come out there and play that way, They're going to learn a lot from that. They're going to learn that the entire NFL was watching and we're watching the entire NFL. That's why these games are so important when you're playing. You need to make sure that you're performing or else we'll find someone else who can. I think there will be a lot of people that learn a lot from this tonight. Coming from Brandon Staley, David, it doesn't get much more sharp than that. Like, I mean, he is putting dudes on blast. And it's true. I mean, a lot of those dudes on special teams were whiffing tackles and not even just special teams, right? We're going to talk about running backs. That applies there, too. If you can't be the guy that can come in and get us four yards a carry or three and a half yards a carry or more than three yards per carry, which none of the Chargers running backs did, we'll go find someone else to do it because a lot of these cuts are going to happen. And just because we have you guys on the roster now doesn't mean we're not looking for better options at the same time. Fire and brimstone straight blades (laughs) from the head coach trying to send a very clear and very direct message. And after that performance in that football game, I think it was warranted. And you give up two kick return touchdowns, a kickoff kick return and punt return in the same game. And it wasn't even particularly close that you were going to get a hand on the guy. Your head coach should be pissed off. So this should be the reaction. And so I think it's very clear now that, If you perform like that again, especially with these, you know, cut down days coming along, the Chargers are going to be looking. And if they see an opportunity to improve their special teams unit, which we know is a huge, huge kryptonite for the Chargers and has been for the last several years, he is going to leave no stone unturned and he will not feel bad about replacing somebody who is going to go out there and do their job and perform at the level that he expects. Yeah, and I mean, I think it also just shows you his commitment to fixing a terrible special teams unit, right? He's dead serious. And dead serious enough to fire Darius Swinton after one season when they were technically improved from the season before that, right? So, like, yeah. a minor improvement improvement wasn't good enough for Brandon Staley last year. 
you need more than that this year. And obviously that's off to a rocky start. Cause there's a lot of those dudes that were out there on those specific plays that are either fighting for a roster spot or will have some role on this team and didn't get it done. Like JT Woods, who we'll talk about later on in the show. Especially. Yeah. But it's up about the running backs. Cause Brandon Steve also had a message for them. I don't think that any of the five running backs played well tonight running backs, you know, paraphrasing there because he didn't say but he said i don't think any of the five of them played well tonight <laughs> and that's what i mean isaiah spiller getting hurt which we'll talk about a little bit but david to me none of them did anything part of it was blocking i mean i think josh kelly came back to earth in a big way i thought there was one he didn't have the biggest run of the game but i also thought there was another one where zion johnson had opened up a nice hole and him and trey pipkins or him and storm norton i think on that one had opened a, a cut back lane where he probably could have got 10 15 yards easy he dropped an easy first down catch from Easton Stick yeah. at one point. That, that one, one was, was tough rough. to watch. I mean, yeah, that ended up pretty much stopping the drive on that because they ended up having a third down. They didn't end up getting it. It, it was really tough, David. I mean, the, the running back situation did not get more clear. I mean, we do know now that Josh Kelly's come back to earth. Larry Roundtree averaged the best yards per carry on the team, and it was 2.8. And then Isaiah Spiller, three carries for three yard gets hurt. And neither of the undrafted free agent running backs did much. I mean, that's pretty much as bad as it gets. Yeah, and and I was going into this game hoping to see something from Larry Roundtree just to give me some kind of glimmer of hope. But yeah, I we had him get code it. red. You know, we said, "Hey, this is kind of got to be it." And he didn't get many carries, but that wasn't it. He didn't get many carries, but he didn't do anything with the carries that he was given either. And I feel so, like his first run was like pretty good, and I was like, "Larry, like, you might okay. do something." Yeah. And the other runs went for like literally zero yards. Well, it's like okay, back back down to earth, back down to the Larry Roundtree that we've seen since he got drafted, which is unfortunate because I yeah. wanted to see him go out there and perform and do. I don't well. think we've seen an explosive run from any running back through this preseason so far. Really? No, no, I don't feel like we have at all, and and that's that's a shame because the Chargers need people to step up to be able to spell Austin Eckler. So Austin Eckler isn't going out there and killing himself because he just doesn't have the frame to go out there and take that beating. And you want to have guys that when they step on the field, they can be serviceable. They can take some of that load off and they can take some important carries that can help win the Chargers some football games. Yeah. After that performance, there's not a lot of confidence to be had after watching that. Yeah, I mean, I did think Josh Kelly had one really nice pass blocking rep where he really cracked a linebacker that was blitzing. I thought that was good to see because that is yeah. some of it, too, is just getting off the Definitely. field third down to have somebody come in who can protect is very nice as well. But Isaiah Spiller, tough, right? I mean, the offensive yeah. line wasn't good all night. He got two carries in the first half, and then his first carry in the third half, he comes up limping. Brayden Steele, didn't seem very concerned. It said he was questionable to come back in the game as if he would ever come back into the game. In yeah. a preseason game when you're a little bit banged up. But does seem to have a minor ankle thing, David. Seems mostly precautionary, but it's probably the end of him in the preseason. And it's like, still don't know if we've gotten to see at all kind of what he's going to bring to the table. Yeah, that, and that, that sucks. Because, I mean, it yeah. definitely was one of the guys that I wanted to watch. I wanted to see him be able to go out there. You wanted him to look really... like Damian Pierce of the yeah. Texans, right? Yeah, like, I, you I know, wanted him to like get an extensive workload, like, and I wanted him to show why we were all excited about watching him play. You know, I wanted yeah. to see some of that shake and bake, some of that content. And it's not balance. all on him either. No, it's not. Obviously, hey, you, you're never going to blame somebody for getting injured. But it's just it's unfortunate that, you know, you can't see this guy go out there and perform. He, you know, he's yeah. a rookie fourth round pick, you know, a guy that we feel like is going to have a role this year in this offense that's going to be able to be somebody – to add a different element to this running game. And unfortunately, we're probably not going to see Isaiah Spiller until the regular season. Yeah. And at that point, like, I mean, it's going to be tough for him to make any meaningful contributions toward being RB2 clearly behind Austin Eckler. I mean, if he is banged up, probably held out at least a week. Brandon Steele, very cautious, definitely, to say the least. I mean, you As know, he should this, be. The, the last game, the last preseason game is on Friday. So right. hard to imagine he's going to get back in there for that. I think his hands have really stood out so far in camp and even in the preseason yeah. a little bit. Easton Stick mi missed him on what would have been like a 10-yard reception and a first down in this one where he beat the linebacker pretty easily. Uh, I, it's just – it's tough because you want him to be good, but like we felt like we were seeing some separation out of the first preseason game, but that's why it's the preseason. That's why things can always change. Josh Kelly came right back down to earth, and now it's just as confusing of a mess at that position – as you could think about, like there, there's no separation. There's no clear number two still behind Austin Eckler. And that was something 
we are hoping to figure out. And I just don't know if that's something that we're going to see get resolved in the last preseason game, David, like at this point, you know, there's only three. questions left unanswered. Unfortunately, it seems that way. And we'll see. Maybe one of them goes for 250 yards in the last preseason game. I don't know. Show me. But the one thing we do know that seems for certain at this point is that the Chargers are going to keep three quarterbacks. But why? What is the best part of what is good about keeping three quarterbacks? And also, JT Woods still developing, obviously having a couple more rough moments and a couple of decent moments as well. So we're going to get into that. But first, I have a message that I have to get to you guys. I think we can all relate to this. We've all been put in a, a spot where you've had a few too many to drink. You're out with your friends. You're hanging out and you're like, should I drive home? Should I get an Uber? And then you're like, nah, I don't need an Uber. I live right down the street. I can just go home. You know, I don't need to get a ride or anything. I'll be fine. What are the odds that you'll get pulled over anyway? Even so, what's the worst that could happen if you do get pulled over? Your insurance goes up, you lose your license, you lose your job, you kill someone. Everyone knows about the risks of driving drunk. The results are tragic and often deadly. However, that still doesn't stop everyone from getting behind the wheel while under the influence. That's why police officers are out there right now looking for impaired drivers on our roads to save lives. So if you think you're okay to drive after a few drinks, think again. Play it safe, plan ahead, get a ride. It only takes one mistake to change your life or someone else's forever. Drive sober or get pulled over. All right. Well, I do think there's a couple more, you know, bright spots that we could get to. And we'll talk about it now, you know, maybe at the end of the show, a couple of guys who stood out on defense. But one of the things that came out from this game, David, was Tom Telesco talking on the broadcast over TV about the Chargers quarterback situation because we know it's Easton Stick and Chase Daniel. Neither one of those guys is going to, you know, inspire faith into you when Justin Herbert leaves the field and one of them has to come on. God forbid, and let's just all pray that never happens. Tom Twesley was already kind of giving this job to both of those guys, David. As much as he's saying, hey, QB2, they're fighting for the backup quarterback position. This isn't running back where you're going to get a running back by committee, which is also what Tom Twesco said. I still didn't think, like, some people took it as him saying, hey, all four of those guys are going to make the team, including Larry Roundtree. Don't know if he went all the way there. Hard to misconstrue what he said about the quarterbacks, David. It seems like, once again, when these tough cuts are happening, the Chargers are going to have to make some tough decisions on some guys who have been really impressive so far that that could get even worse because of the three-quarterback situation on the Chargers. Last year in the COVID year, I completely understand carrying three quarterbacks. You never know what could happen. Somebody catch COVID. Well, with the close contact rules and stuff, too, you know, even going back before that, where it's like, hey, your whole QB room, and they think about the Broncos two years ago, where it's Kendall Hinton that had to get a start, right? Because it was like you and everyone around you. Last year wasn't as much, right? Because if you were vaccinated just because you were close to someone, it didn't necessarily automatically rule you out. This year, we have seen quarterbacks test positive for COVID and missed games like Kirk Cousins already did in the preseason so far. We've seen a couple cases of that, but like it, it just doesn't make any sense, David, to me. Uh, and it seems like, you know, you could have a guy on the practice squad that could be a third quarterback for your team if you need it. Let's be real. If Justin Herbert is not playing quarterback for the Chargers, then it doesn't matter anyway. You're screwed either way. Yeah. You're screwed. It does not matter. Easton Stick nor Chase Daniel is going to be any kind of savior in any way. No disrespect, but they are not anywhere close to a Justin Herbert. They look like backup quarterbacks. And and hey, this is year three for Justin Herbert. Year two in the same offense. Feel like he probably already has a very good handle on the offense. Now I don't understand the reasoning behind carrying three quarterbacks. You're taking a roster spot, a position away from a different position group that could be a lot more important to have that quality depth. You just don't need it. It doesn't make sense. I don't understand it. But here we are with the Chargers carrying three quarterbacks again. Yeah, I mean, at least it seems that way, right? I mean, Tom Twelska could just be blatantly lying to everyone, but it does seem like that seems to be their philosophy. They have a good quarterback room. They don't want to mess with it. I mean, if Easton sticks on in your practice squad, I mean, he's still going to be in the quarterback room, right? So, I mean, it, it will. I just think it's it's kind of crazy. And honestly, whether between Easton Stick and Chase Daniel, I mean, I guess Chase Daniel was the one that's, you know, probably more wise and could give Justin Herbert more tips and things like that. And I don't know how much he's giving that stuff to him, right? I know it's hard for me to quantify how valuable it is to have Chase Daniel as a backup, but at least I get it. To keep both of them, I don't get it. Because, I mean, I understand if you wanted to go Stick instead of Daniel, I could understand. I mean, it was a, a hard... A, Easton Stick had some nice plays. I think he has shown a little bit of development, right? He had some nice plays stepping up in the pocket. He did miss several pretty open throws. He had a very ugly interception. 
He yeah. had a fumble right before halftime and a two minute drill, which obviously the offensive lineman's getting beat, and that's yeah, tough Ryan to Hunter totally got beat put badly on badly on that one. Totally, but either way, right? This is your chance. I mean, two turnovers obviously doesn't look yeah, good. The, the missed throws don't look good. The throw to Josh Palmer was nice. He underthrew Jalen Guyton on one that should have been defensive pass interference. A hundred percent. I guess the other thing is that was just like he could be a wild card. Yeah, I mean, he has a twenty two yard scramble, right? That's part of his yeah. game as well. He he could do some crazy stuff and go win you a game potentially. Maybe sure. even more likely than Chase Daniel, who I think would be more of a hey, don't lose me this game situation. Yeah. So I can understand if you're trying to decide which one of them would be better to be Justin Herbert's backup. I just can't understand why you think both of them need to be Justin Herbert's backup, <laughs> I guess. You know, that just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But let's talk about JT Woods because he's a guy that we talked about last week. I mean, him and Dean Leonard were the two standout guys who had rough games they needed to bounce back from, right? I mean, we saw some positives and some negatives. JT Woods, David, a, another really up and down game, I would say. Yeah, I mean, it's it just it, the story is the same here. The, the coverage ability is there. The instincts are there. You see that. You know, you see it when you're watching him. It's just the, the tackles. And, and the one example that just comes blaring into my mind is a, like a, a fly sweep where, you know, you had Turpin in the hole one on one and you miss an ankle tackle and he runs right past you for and collects several extra yards after that. Those yeah. are situations that you have to you're going to you're going to be in <laughs> in the regular season and you got to make that tackle uh, because that could turn into a first down could turn into a touchdown if you don't get that guy on the ground. And that's where that trust level is going to come into play with him and the coaching staff. The coaching staff has to feel like, hey, if I put you in this situation, if I put you out there on an island or in you know, the, the middle and you're the last line of defense defender, I got to feel like you're going to be able to make that tackle and get that guy on the ground. And right now, for him, that is definitely still a work in progress. Yeah, I mean, I, part of me thinks he's just a little too small still, right? He does I mean, look that, a little bit small, he's, man. He's very yeah. thin. He's real thin out there, and that was always going to be a problem. I was questioning his tackling coming out, right? That was one of the biggest questions we had for any rookie going into the preseason was how is this dude going to tackle and show that yeah. that's somewhere he's improved a lot on going into the next level. And he did have a couple of nice tackles. That's the hard thing, right? On the yeah. kickoff return, the one kickoff, the non Touchdown kickoff return, right? He had a nice open field tackle that he was pretty physical on. He had another nice physical tackle in this game, too. But there was another play where he hit a tight end, right? And him and, like, three other chargers missed the tight end. He ends up going for, like, 25 yards, which should have been, like, you know, a four- or five-yard game. Yeah. That obviously is tough, right? And there's another play where he just got absolutely truck uh, mm-hmm. you know, by Malik Davis, uh, an undrafted free agent running back from the Cowboys. I didn't think that was a missed tackle because it was kind of as the dude was going down, he kind of just got bowled over. But, like, that's an undrafted free agent, right? That dude's hungry and, you know, was lowering his shoulder and everything else too. But, like, those are the people you're going to have to come up and stop. You're going to have to come up and try to tackle Travis Kelsey like in giant dudes like that with the ball in their hands, right? That Those are all part of the game. So, I think the biggest thing here, David, is just now, I mean, Daniel Parker – just put something out about the the game afterwards too and it just said like hey like this is kind of a concerning thing like he seems like he kind of felt like the chargers wanted this dude to come in and take a low he gilman spot yeah and as of right now i just don't know how you could trust him on the field when the games actually mean something and it just seems like it's going to take a lot more development than that well and they're definitely willing to wait too i mean if if the way they handled brendan hymas is any indication if they don't feel comfortable with you getting on the football field you're not going to play and so for JT Woods, he, he's going to have to show the coaching staff that he can go out there and tackle or else he's not going to get on the football field. I mean, yeah. they're probably looking at this as a long term situation. We think that JT Woods could get on the field and play some meaningful snaps, but he's going to have to earn that. He's going to have to show the coaching staff that he can do that. And if he doesn't, the Chargers, uh, this Chargers coaching staff and organization has shown that they are not afraid to leave you on the bench. Yeah, I mean, it just we've seen that play, right? We've seen the zero out of miss those tackles as the mm-hmm. last line of defense before that. It was Rayshon yep. Jenkins before that. It was Julio Adai. Like, yep. it's been a problem. And that's, it, it's, you can't have that in the back end. And, and obviously the tackling has been a problem for the whole team. JT Woods is not the only guy who's been oh, missing no. tackles for the Chargers, but it's been a, a plague for them during the preseason. But it just, you're not going to get what he does bring to the table because of what he doesn't bring to the table. Exactly. So you, you don't get to get the, 
great ball skills and leading the country in interceptions. You don't get to get the four, three speed that he brings to the table. You don't get any of that because you still have to be able to do the most important thing as a defender. And that is tackle somebody when they're in front of you with the football. He hasn't shown he can do that consistently enough yet. And I think there's been some really good signs. I thought he was a half step away from an interception with the guy just here. Taylor was covering. Yeah. Pause, maybe a little bit, you know, undercutting around. Like you can see it's there. There is a lot to build on and a lot to love about this dude. You have to be able to tackle. And I mean, so do the rest of the Chargers defensive backs. He might get on the field because of other people's lack of tackling. So yeah. if you're not tackling, it's hard to, you know, earn playing time, especially and hard to earn the, the trust of your coaching staff. But I mean, I thought Michael Davis, on the other hand, had a really good day in the secondary. And I thought the other Davis brother, of course, I'm talking about Jamal Davis also had a really nice game, David, and deserved to be shouted out. I think Carlo Kemp had kind of an underrated game as well. The edge rushers were playing good. But Jamal Davis specifically, David, brings an edge to this edge group. I mean, he's a yeah. guy that's super physical yes. uh, and everything you hear about him. Hey, not a super, you know, technician as far as his pass rushing skills. And we haven't seen him get a lot. I mean, he had quite a few pressures in the first game, but he didn't do much as a pass rusher in this game. But what he did do is his average depth of tackle was 0.3 yards and he had three tackles I so love that, and, and two of them were behind the line of scrimmage. And the dude plays mean. And obviously yeah. we know the chargers, you know, if Kyle Van Noy is going to be an off ball linebacker, that leaves Joey Bosa, Chris Rumpf, and Khalil Mack. That's a, a very shallow group. We knew there might be, a, you know, an opening for this. Make a boy ends up falling off because he can't play in this game. And Jamal Davis deserves a shout-out for playing really well and I think at least would bring a, something to this team as far as a backup edge rusher that even Chris Rump might not. Yeah, and and unlike some of the comments that Brandon Stelly made about other parts of the team, he made some positive comments about Jamal Davis. Said that this is a guy that we like. He's one of our guys. We we love coaching him. We love the way that he plays. And I can understand that. You you know, you watch him play and he sets a physical edge. You know, he's he's really a, a guy that, you know, you might not be the most technically refined type of player, but but he's, he's got a pro body and we're gonna figure it out. <laughs> That's what I think of because the dude looks like Superman. I he mean, definitely does look like, like Superman, but you know, he Greek like I said, he, he's the guy that really controls the edge and you know, he does a really good job of that. And I think the pass rushing skills can can develop. He's got two really really good teachers that are in that same room that can help bring that part of his game along. Yeah, and I mean there's a lot more to rushing the passer to being an edge rusher, right? I mean, Absolutely. that is the most important thing, but sometimes you do need the dudes who can go in there and be super physical, and he's super strong yeah. at the point of the attack. I mean, I said at one point he had bench-pressed the Cowboys tight end to get a tackle for loss. Yeah. Did. I mean, he just shucked the dude right off the bat. A guy, I saw Chris Rump even, who had a nice tackle for loss, struggling with earlier in the game to disengage from a block. So I think there is something to that, dude. It's at least intriguing, and he at least puts himself on the map going into this third preseason game where anything can happen and, and that there's going to be a lot to look for. And we will be back getting into what we're looking for in the last preseason game later on in the week. But tomorrow there's something we must address and it's more Justin Herbert disrespect him coming in at number. You think Justin Herbert's the 40th best football player in the NFL right now? Someone has to pay. So to make sure you guys don't miss tomorrow's show, make sure to go follow us wherever you get your podcast from. You can find the lockdown Chargers podcast there. You can also subscribe to the lockdown Chargers YouTube channel. If you're watching right now, Make sure to go hit that subscribe button. And if you do like the show, make sure to rate and review if you can on your platform as well. Because we're bringing this to you guys, you know, six, seven shows a week. And we want to be for free every day. And we always want to be your guys' first listen. But if you guys need to, a second listen is available right now. And that's the Lockdown Fantasy Football Podcast. And right now, they're giving top 10 lists at every position. Starting today on Lockdown NFL Fantasy for Lockdown Fantasy and the Lockdown Dynasty Podcast. Make sure you guys are checking that out. So you can go and win your leagues. But we also post the show to all of our social media. So you can find the show on my Twitter at Dan Talk Sports and David Drogmeyer's Twitter at Drotalk SD. You can also find the show's page at Locked On LAC and our at Locked On Chargers Instagram page and our Locked On Chargers Facebook page. If you guys want to call into the show, you can do that at 323-524-7924. Trying to get every Chargers voice fan play on the show. And after this week, we'll have a lot more time to get into fan mail and voicemails and stuff. So make sure you guys get those in. You can put your questions anywhere you want. David Drogemeyer's DMs are always open. But we'll be back with you guys tomorrow to talk about a bunch of Chargers already making it on the top NFL 100 list, but also one that is supremely disrespected, so we have to protect the golden boy, Justin Herbert. But until then, take it easy and go Bulls.